The Linux Action Show is created by Jupiter Broadcasting. It's sponsored by Ting. Go to last.ting.com to save off your first device or plan and DigitalOcean. Go over to digitalocean.com and use our promo code LASTDIGITAL and then you can spin up your own Linux rig for free. Yeah, the Linux Action Show, episode 357. My name is Chris. My name is Noah. Hello, Noah. Good morning to you from uh, North Dakota over there. Good morning. It's a chilly morning. It, it was a chillier night. I think it was like 19 degrees last night. Oh, really? I think it. Yeah. I think right now it's about uh, 54, 55 outside. Probably by this afternoon, yeah. I will not be able to wear the sweatshirt anymore. I'm wearing it while I can. I definitely have the door, or I'm sorry, the window to the studio cracked just to kind of help keep a breeze going in here because it's a little toasty. Mm-hmm. It's a little too comfortable. You know what I'm saying? A little too comfortable. I hear you. Okay, yeah, you do. Hey, Noah, guess what? We're going to do a review of Cody this week, Cody 14.2, which is just about to come out. We'll tell you what's new, what they're fixing, and uh, where we think the Cody project is at, and in comparative to some of the other competitors on the market. And then, as we wrap up, we'll take a look ahead at the new release that's just about to come out, version 15.0. So some pretty cool stuff, and of course, we'll give you our thoughts on where the project is headed. Not only do we have all of that, we've got in the news segment, we're talking about the Windows 10 Secure Boot Hoopla, some potential GPL violations for Ubuntu Touch, DuckDuckGo's contributions to open source, and some major new software releases on the Linux desktop. But Noah, on top of all of that, you know what? It's our picks. We We have have picks? picks. Yeah, and uh, this one, was this sent in, uh, this uh, runs links sent in by an audience member? It was. I watched this live when it and happened. I believe he is credited. I didn't even. I didn't even think. I didn't even think to make this runs Linux. I watched uh, part of this live, but uh, this was sent in by Philip B. And uh, he uh, notes that the uh, new NVIDIA Digits box runs Linux, and not just that, but all of the presentation around the Digit box runs Linux, even the on stage stuff. So it's a Digits dev box. It's part of a dev program where engineers can get access to a, a four Titan X GPU with seven teraflops of precision. Uh, compute, 336 gigabits of memory bandwidth, and 12 gigabytes of memory per board. And then the NVIDIA Digit software that runs on top of Ubuntu 14.04. And uh, this thing is nuts. Here's a, If you're watching the video version, you can see it. Uh, to get in on the, on the dev program, Noah, the cost is... 15000 Yes, fifteen. you were right. It is $15,000. Uh, and uh, the guys at PC... Because I looked it up last night. Oh, you, ch- you cheated. No, you cheated. That's cool, because I actually thought it was 10000 so I'm glad you did. Uh, yeah. The guys at PC Per had a chance to get a little info about it, and uh, Ryan Shrout is interviewing uh, one of the folks at NVIDIA while they're demoing it. And you can see in the video here, it's definitely running on top of Linux. All right, what Digits does is it's actually a user interface that makes it easy for data scientists to access data sets, to develop and structure um, uh, networks, and to then also train and then to evaluate how effective those are. So it's kind of a, a turnkey solution for data scientists for deep learning. Okay. And it all runs on top of uh, this Linux UI here. And, and, and Noah, what do you think? Uh, maybe with that kind of horsepower, you might be able to get decent performance out of Lightworks? <laughs> uh, I think I think that uh, your Lightworks problems stem from user error and uh-huh, or uh, uh-huh. poor distro selection. Uh-huh, but yeah, of course. Uh, yes, I think that you would have I think that you would have no problem running Lightworks on on something that powerful. Although, honestly, I think Lightworks would be kind of a waste of yeah, uh, a waste yeah. of power for oh, something yeah, like for that. Sure. I mean, yeah. I, I would want to try and like cure cancer or search for extraterrestrial yep. activity or something like that. Yep. And if I had that kind of you know, that kind of power. You know, they used to have those screensavers that would do those calculations. Imagine what you could do with something like that. Right. Yeah, I mean, this thing is set up for somebody that can take advantage of uh, all the software that can run on this thing and then also plug into the digit software that uh, NVIDIA provides, which is the uh, part that takes advantage of the neural (laughs) networks for uh, image classification, which sounds pretty nuts. Pretty cool, though, and right. it's neat to see some of that Premiere stuff that's really high-end, not just launched on Linux, not just running on Linux, but also demoed on Linux on stage and at the convention, which to me is like this right. complete faith in the Linux desktop, which is awesome. Right. And and not and not uh, spe- not specific Linux and, and not um, not custom not custom engineered distros. Not right. Not we Nvidia some Linux. Software, so we paid some, op- huh? Not like Nvidia yeah, I mean, unbreakable so it's Linux essentially- or whatever. Right, right. It's actually regular desktop uh, Ubuntu, and yeah. and so it, it, the kind of the idea. And the, the other nice thing about that is, much like uh, the su- the supercomputers that are now x86 based, you can write the code on your laptop on your on your Intel i3 laptop, and then move that code over to these really powerful, really beefy machines, and then have them have them actually do do the work. But you can do all the development on a normal computer because it is a regular computer. Right. Um, and I think that's really exciting. You can see before you invest that fifteen thousand, can I get the code to work? Can I get my my applications to work? Can I right. get it to do the things I need to do? Okay, now I've got all that done. Now I want to do it faster. Now here's my question. Chris. 
Chris. Do you think how many bitcoins do you think you could mine on that thing? Actually, the Nvidia GPUs are classically not all that great for mining Bitcoin. But oh, really? I suppose if you have okay. that much hard, hardcore horsepower, you might you probably wouldn't be able to pay for the rig. No, you probably would not. Yeah. Know, not with the price of Bitcoin. No, you days. probably wouldn't. I suppose you'd be better off spending fifteen thousand on ASICs. Yeah, probably exactly right. Uh, or maybe over at DigitalOcean, our sponsor for the Linux Action Show, or DigitalOcean.com and check them out. And don't forget our promo code Last Digital. Why spend money? We'll save you some money. You'll get a ten dollar credit when you use the promo code Last Digital. All one word, LAS Digital. DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider, and they're dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way for you to spin up your own cloud server. And that is a fact. You can get started in less than 55 seconds. To get your own server, just run up and running, less than 55 seconds. You're going to have root access to that thing, HTML5 console, uh, any distro you've chosen from there, uh, or free, free BSD that they have available. And their pricing plans start only $5 a month. That's amazing. That's a great deal. That'll get you 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. And DigitalOcean has data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, and London. They got multiple data centers in those spots, so you can get some serious geo diversity, spread some stuff around, and their interface that powers all of it, so that you can go over there and set this up in less than 55 seconds. So you can choose your distributions, so you can have a cloud server that's powered by SSDs based on top of Linux, using the KVM virtualizer, some of the best data centers with tier one bandwidth all over the world for five dollars a month they wrap it all together with this great interface it's intuitive but you can do anything you need set up and deploy your droplets back them up snapshot them destroy them replicate them hand them off to somebody else you can do full feature dns management and easily manage your domains one of the things i think is particularly great is the one-click deployment of applications of things like docker uh, gitlab wordpress ghost which come on Ghost is awesome. That's the Markdown blogging tool. You just write your blog post in Markdown and save them to your Ghost blog, and boom, you got it. It's got a nice CMS, too, and you can just go one click to play it. It's really nice. Or GitLab. You know, we've talked about synchronizing your user configs between all your Linux desktops. It Can it be done? Well, it, maybe. I mean, one way to do it would probably be to manage all of your configs through GitLab. Have your own GitLab server or your own own cloud server. It's really great. Plus, they have tons of awesome tutorials. They have Core OS. You can play around with that, which I think is going to be a huge deal. I mean, that's look at you can see when Canonical responds with Ubuntu Snappy Core, that's obviously a response to Core OS. And you get to play with all those different technologies up on DigitalOcean. And when you use the promo code LastDigital, you're going to get that $10 credit. Try it out two weeks. Absolutely free. So many things you can do up on DigitalOcean. Go check them out. And a big thanks, DigitalOcean. Last Digital, when you check out. I just uh, recently logged into my uh, rigs and did updates across the board to make sure everything's nice and clean. You know, no, I just like to go and do a little housekeeping from time to time. Well, what would you do? What would you have done if something would have gone wrong, though? I mean, then you'd have to rebuild your droplet from scratch. Oh, yeah, yeah, because I wouldn't just take the snapshot and restore the snapshot. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's right. You yeah. have snapshots. Yeah. You know, last this just this past week, I had a I had a group that they had a uh, they had a server that was having some issues, and, and I said, well, you know, we can bring in a we can be bring in a you know a, uh, we have a temporary server we can bring in so that you can use it for the time being until we can get something permanent sorted out. And he goes, no, nah, I'd rather I'd rather just uh, I'd rather just leave it. And I'm like, well, it could die at any time. And he goes, yeah. How long will it take to get a new one in? And I'm like, seven to ten business days, depending. And he goes, yeah, I think I think we'll just leave it running. And I'm like. All right, well, here's the thing. At least we should start making backups, like hourly backups of your database. It's not all that big. It's just a couple hundred megs. Um, and, and let's make sure that we have all the data so that when it crashes, because I know it's going to crash before the new one gets here, probably like the day before, actually. Uh, and, uh, and I said, we should make some backups. And he goes, oh, great. Where are we going to store those? So I had to think for a second. I went, I have the perfect idea. So logged into DigitalOcean, spun up a little droplet. And because the database is only a couple hundred megs, it, it just it, uh, R syncs over and it works great. And again, it's one of those things where if, if I had, even if I had my own virtual server that I could use for stuff like this, I would have to go over there and, and, and log in and copy the image over or actually run an install. With DigitalOcean, I log in from their computer um, on their web browser and spin up the right. droplet and, yep. then, and then set up the, all the AirSync stuff. Yeah. It, it's, it, it literally took, I think, 10 minutes That's to get nice everything too. till the first and backup as, was And as somebody yeah. like yourself who's a, supplying, you know, contract work, that gives you a higher value because you can give that client something at a much faster turnaround rate at a way lower price point than ever before. And just right. to wrap it all up, so, you know, their interface, I always go on about how great their interface is because it's truly great, but... Um, a practical example of the API they have available is I heard from a listener who uh, has it set up so that when he does updates, first, when he so he has a command he triggers that sets off a series of events, and the first thing it does is it does a DigitalOcean snapshot of his droplet, then huh. it performs the system updates, 
And I thought, you know, so that way he can always just roll back because he's got some databases on there and things like that. He just rolls back right. if there's a problem. And it's just a nice, like, really simple way to use the API. That uh, There's examples out there and great tutorials to do all of that stuff. So go over to DigitalOcean and use the promo code uh, Last Digital. Big things, DigitalOcean. All right, so we got to do a uh, desktop app pick that is a make good on the show. We've actually even mentioned it on air before, but never really zeroed in on it, never put it on the picks list, never said this is one of the things you should get for your Linux desktop, especially if you are a Pandora user. And so, Noah, today we make good on this. Which app are we doing today? Play it out. We are doing Pythos. Pythos. Which, uh, I don't think it's in the... I don't think it's in the show notes, but it was submitted by Gamma, of all people. And um, he has been ragging on me to switch from Spotify. And I can't say that he's been 100% successful yet, but I will admit that he makes some remarkably uh, good arguments for it. So I installed it, and I've been using it for, uh, well, really for a couple days. Um, and I have to admit, it, it, I think the way that it, I, from my, the best of my understanding, it actually takes advantage of a vulnerability in uh, in the API for Pandora, um, which is how that uh, allows uh, Pythos to work. So I don't think it's actually a uh, a supported uh, platform mm, right. for Pandora. Yeah. I don't think they but necessarily want it to be there, but I don't think they can do for anything Linux about users, people what using you get it. is a native GTK Pandora client. Uh, that does, uh, you know, you can use like keyboard controls to play, pause your Pandora music, which is nice, or your integrated uh, window mm -hmm. manager, desktop environments, play management controls if they have it. It pulls down cover right. art. Uh, it does uh, last FM uh, scrobbling support. It has proxy support. And so I have it, I have it installed uh, right here. And uh, I just figured uh, I'd just give you a little example. So here's all my stations. And uh, I have a lot because I've been using, I've used Pandora for a long time. And I can just hit play right here. And it starts up my uh, Ronald Jenkins, and I because uh, in the settings, which I like this quite a bit. No, I don't know if you've done this. You probably already have. Uh, and so it has plug-in support, right? Uh, but in Pandora here, you can set your uh, audio quality to high. So that way, I'm getting a 192 kilobit audio stream from Pandora right now in Pythos. Uh, right. And then uh, if I hit if I hit pause on my keyboard, it pauses the uh, the music there, which is really nice, and it'll minimize and down it does my. Go ahead. It does have support for a premium subscription. So if you yes. have a premium Pandora subscription, which Pandora that was my one. initial argument against uh, Pandora over Spotify. Spotify, they give me an ad every once in a while, but I never run out of Spotify. It just it continues to go, and and um, they said, well, for, you know, for the cost, you should give it a shot and just see if it's not in, it ends up not being worth it. And like I said, I don't know that I'm a hundred percent converted yet because the nice thing about paying for Spotify is I can do I can sync music to my yes, phone. Yes. So if I'm not going if I'm going to be on an airplane, so there are that's things a good that I data really like about too. Mm -hmm. And also so the, the, really the like shared the shared playlists on Spotify. Pandora doesn't have anything that touches that, and mm -hmm. and Spotify also offers the music streaming. And Spotify also has a uh, quote unquote native Linux desktop client. So those are things right. that I, it's native. I mean, it is. The, it's it's written in. in uh, yeah, I mean, it's a web browser. It's like it's like a web thing. You know, I mean, it's like I mean, it's like, yeah, it's slow. Yeah. And stuff. But you know what? It integrates with the uh, the keyboard yes. stuff and does everything I would expect from a music right. app. Anyway, the only other thing I like about Pandora, and this is kind of silly, but Pandora, if I set up my stations and all that other whatnot, when I sign into my refrigerator, then I can use Pandora on my refrigerator. Yeah. <laughs> so check that box. You know. Check that box. Uh, all right. You know, uh, also, Pino Bar, just a quick honorable mention. We've made that a pick before, but that is a command line version of a Pandora client, which is super cool if you have, like, a drop-down terminal like Tilda or Quake. All right. So let's talk about something in the spotlight this week that uh, the timing is really tight, especially if you're not listening to this show on release day. But it's something that we have a chance to get involved in, and there's a lot of potential here. It's Document Freedom Day, and uh, it's a, an event that's going on on Tuesday March, I believe that would be uh, March 24th, 2015. Document Freedom Day is an event to raise awareness about open documents uh, formats around the world. And as you probably guessed, the o uh, Open Document Foundation is putting this on. And uh, they actually have a little bit of funding to even help if you maybe want to raise a awareness by like going to a local library and telling people about it and things like that uh, or, or holding an event of some kinds. I'll give you more information about that. But... Noah was at scale, and he had a chance to talk with someone from the Libre Office project about Document Freedom Day. And uh, so instead of me rambling on about it, we'll just get it right from the horse's mouth. Why not? Tell me about Open Document Freedom Day. Just Document Freedom Day. Document Freedom Day. Yeah. Tell me about Document Freedom Day. Document Freedom Day, or DFD, uh, is a... Uh, is an annual event run by the Free Software Foundation Europe. So that's the um, uh, sister, sister sort of group of uh, Free Software Foundation. Um, and the idea is that there's one day a year um, when people can run events 
um, talking about open, uh, free and open formats and, uh, and protocols, um, and talk about the importance of those uh, for us in terms of our personal uh, life, um, using that work or in government education. So. The idea is that uh, on this one day, this year will be uh, the 25th of March, mm -hmm. and we'd love to see people around the United States and around the world um, putting on an event, inviting some people um, to participate, uh, maybe to learn more about open formats, mm -hmm. maybe to give a presentation at their local library or community center uh, to people uh, learning how to use, say, LibreOffice or Inkscape or other free software that implements open formats, um, and how, how they can use those formats and the benefits of open formats, because a lot of people just don't know um, the idea of uh, the concepts of open formats uh -huh. and what those can provide in terms of data interoperability, uh, right. freedom from vendor lock-in, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Um, so basically what's going on is, um, uh, yeah, we have a little poster here about, um, about Document Freedom Day, um, but it'd be great for people to go to uh, documentfreedom.org, mm -hmm. that's the website. Um, you can sign up to run an event in your local community. Um, there's a bunch of in information on the site about how to run an event, et cetera. Um, but from my perspective inside the U.S., um, yeah, we'd love to see people running events. Um, there's funding to help people run the events, have food, um, or otherwise put an event um, in your local community. I like that a lot. Uh, you know, some of the uh, uh, libraries around the Seattle area, they just have rooms you can go rent out for free and have a little food there and, uh, and have people come in and talk about it. Yeah, I'm sorry, it's March 25th, uh, not the 24th. And uh, you can find more at documentfreedom.org, including um, you can just see if there's events that might be in your area if you just want to go check it out. Or if you want to add your event, you want to throw your own and become part of it, uh, there's a, they have a section for that. Uh, no, is there anything, you know, like uh, from maybe from like, like an Alta Speed perspective, like client awareness you've thought about or things? Yep. In fact, uh, originally the plan was to, we were going to participate in it this year, and f quite frankly, we've just been too busy. To, uh, we've just been too busy to allocate resources to do it. Um, but the reality is, we have had a number of hotels that have switched from Microsoft Office over to LibreOffice, and they've been very happy with it because, from their perspective, they are getting they are able to open the uh, the latest documents. So I had a guy. Uh, general manager of a hotel and every three months or so I would get an email from him and he would send me a document and say can you open this and convert it into something I can open it with and it was because he was using an older version of office and they'd switched to docx and he hadn't updated in 10 years and so it's just this huge pain in the butt and eventually we got to a point and I said listen the software that I'm using to convert this stuff is free you know that I, like we can install it on your computer it, it will <laughs> run then you can open your own documents and convert them and then if it really makes you happy you you can open them in LibreOffice and resave them as a regular their doc and then open them back up in Microsoft Office, right, which is yeah. actually what he does. It's kind of uh, ridiculous. But, I, I, but, but uh, I have we have uh, we had that other girl that came in and asked if LibreOffice was the uh, was the Mac version of of Microsoft Office or if it was Apple's version. I mean, it's it's getting mistaken for, for commercial software because it has become that good. And so, what I would say is, and what uh, the reason that I want to participate in this event specifically is because I think there are a lot of people out there that have this idea that LibreOffice or OpenOffice is is software that is that's not quite as good or that it's a little outdated or that the UI is a little clunky and that may have been the case in the past but I don't believe it's the case anymore and now with the newest version of course they have that UI refresh and it's even better yeah and it really does seem to be getting better and better too which I'm glad mm -hmm. because uh uh, I am not so sure if uh, I'm all on board with some of the direction the commercial uh, guys want to go with more and more web-based stuff. I just am still struggling right. to really like typing in a web browser. I still prefer to type in a native application and then paste it Good. into a web form and things like that. Good. Yeah. Th then then LibreOffice is even better for you because Microsoft is heavily pushing 360. Their pricing structure yeah, right, exactly. is designed That's what I was to thinking. really, really push people yes. into 360. Then yes. the, the, you know what? 360, honestly, is an easier product to sell than Microsoft Office. Spend $400 yeah, for I a know. product that will be outdated in a year or yeah. spend $99 for and just get it all the time. Year, but then at the end of the year, you get the, yeah, you get the newest one at the end of the year. And the other thing that I like about pushing 360 is it, it, it isn't necessarily a hindrance for moving towards Linux because it actually works in Linux. Yeah. So there's that. Hey, uh, hey, Noah, how about a little quick uh, Linux Fest Northwest update? Uh, just uh, kind of happy to see this. Uh, I think our, our mentions have gone a long way. Jupiter Broadcasting is now listed as not only a community sponsor, which is really the one I'm really happy to see, but also as a media sponsor, which is really great. And uh, we are super excited about Linux Fest Northwest this year, April 25th and the 26th. Uh, here's what I know so far. You ready for this, Noah? It's a pretty good list. Uh, so you're confirmed coming. 
Um, uh, Alan Jude. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Alan Jude from TechSnap and BSD Now confirmed coming. Uh, Chris Moore uh, from uh, PC uh, from uh, BSD Now and PCBSD yes. con- confirmed coming. Uh, um, obviously, myself is confirmed coming. Uh, I'm trying to think what other hosts do we have. From- Michael Dominic is like is like uh, is like 70 percent confirmed coming right now. We just have to work out details. We have producers that are coming uh, that are confirmed to be coming. Like it's going to be a huge in studio. I think we're going to have in studio BSD Nows. Where obviously you're going to be in here for a while. We're going to do a lot of projects in studio and make a ton of content mm-hmm. out of it. So it's not just what I'm really excited about is it's not just the Linux Fest weekend where we're going to have a big party, but the days leading up to it, we're going to do a whole bunch of content in studio that we have never been able to do before. Uh, and so also really excited. We've reached 179 shir- shirts sold. Our, our unlock goal was 150, and then everything after 150 is sort of like uh, funding us towards Linux Fest more and more to help with that initiative. We're going to have lots of good giveaways at uh, the booth. We'll probably also have a few things you can buy in person, some really old stuff that's really rare or a few goodies that you can, you can be, you'll be able to purchase in person at the Fest. But if you'd like to help us get out to Linux Fest Northwest and do some on-the-ground coverage of one of the coolest Linux community events, go to teespring.com slash Linux and grab yourself a T-shirt or one of the long sleeve shirts, which I like a lot, or the hoodie, which I'm wearing uh, one of their hoodies right now. This is the Tech Talk Today one. Super comfortable. And uh, there's lots of good colors, too. You can go check it out. And they also have a ladies' tee and a kids' one at teespring.com slash Linux. And that helps us get out to Linux Fest Northwest, which I am getting really excited about. I think I'm looking forward to this one the most this year, Noah. That's what I feel like. Yeah, me too. Do you know why? Why? Because I'm hoping that I'm hoping that I can uh, I can uh, I can bamboozle you into using Linux to broadcast. Well, we'll see, won't we? We will see what, how yeah. it goes. Now, it's going to be interesting because in one corner, you've got the Linux Action Show voting for an all Linux coverage, and in the other corner, you've got the fine, fine, well tested and tried and true, proven broadcasting skills of one Mr. Chase Nunes, who kept us live the whole time. Last right. last year, and let us and not I even will, worry I about it. Get, we were all hands off, and yeah. we just focused on other stuff. Just saying. And and I will give him credit. It looked amazing. I mean, it really looked. It was good. like lower thirds so, on the fly, Noah. Lower thirds on the fly, Noah. Yeah. Lower yeah, thirds. I know. I know. It looked really. It re- looked really slick. In fact, I would say that that was probably some of the best uh, live coverage I think that, that yeah. the network has ever done. So I I, I admit that it's a. So, I admit that it's a. Uh, this seems a like there's only there's only one practical solution. Uh, we got to sit down. We got to have some beer. We got to have some food. And we got to talk about it. So, but the here's, thing is... Here's my, here, so here's... Am I allowed to cheat? Because here's what I could do. We could just give Chase more beer than anyone else at the table, and eventually he'll be like, ah, oh, yeah, just Linux, that's You fine. know what? Or, I have a really bad memory. I'm not even going to remember you said that. So... Okay. How would I know? How would I know? Yeah, yeah. It's not, like, know? it's not like it's recorded or anything, so... I'm that's good. That's right. Yeah, it's, it's not clear. like it went over uh, the live stream or anything. Nothing to yeah, incriminate me. Happen. Nothing. We'll no, just see how that nothing. goes. Uh, yeah. Either way, it's going to be a good time, and just the, I'm even looking forward to the conflicts leading up to it. Should be some good drunken fights. Nothing, those are my favorite. All right, Noah. Well, with the picks all done, you know what? We got to get out of here because it's time for the news. So let's go. Hey, it's the news, and this episode is brought to you by Ting.com. Go over to last.ting.com, last.ting.com, and get yourself, get, get, get yourself a great discount off your first Ting device, or if you have a Ting-compatible device, here's how it works. If you have a device that works for the Ting network already, which there are so many of them now that Ting supports a wide range of GSM devices, you'll get a $25 service credit, and this is going to blow your mind. That will probably pay for your first month of service, or darn near it. It paid for mine. $25 of service credit. That's the kind of value that Ting has. But if you don't have a device, if you go to last.ting.com, they'll take $25 off your first device. These devices have no contracts. You own them, they're unlocked, and you put them on the Ting network, and Ting rocks, because you only pay for what you use. It's a flat $6 for the line, and then it's your usage on top of that. Ting takes your minutes, your messages, your megabytes. They add them all up, and whatever you fall, whatever bucket you fall into, that's all you got to pay. I've got three lines right now, and I've been using the phone a lot this month, organizing things for Linux Fest Northwest. So this is like my biggest phone bill ever on Ting, and it's like $70 for three phones, three smartphones. And you get hotspot, tethering, caller ID, all of it built in. And what I love about it is I've got the Nexus 5. And you can get the Nexus 5 still if you can find them. Just put the Ting uh, SIM in there. I have the GSM SIM in here right now. So I'm on the Ting GSM network. You can get the Nexus 6 or whatever, right? But what I love about the Nexus line, and to this day, I still think the Nexus 5 is one of the best phones on the market, is this is unlocked. I, just, I put a Ting GSM SIM in here. I'm paying for what I use. I have no contract. I have no early termination fee, and I have Android Lollipop 
I've got the absolute latest from the Googs, straight from the Googs. I'm on my own network. I can switch between CDMA and GSM if I need to, which is pretty awesome. And uh, I know that Ting's got my back if I ever have any tr- troubles because I call him at one eight five five ting ftw and a real human being answers the phone. The other thing is Ting is hip to the cool apps. And for those of us who are parents, like Noah and I, which, Noah, what's the YouTube policy in your house? Have you had any YouTube challenges like I've had? Have you had any YouTube challenges? Yeah. Yeah, well, the the thing is, like, my son will start with a good YouTube video, right. but then he quickly moves on to bad YouTube yes. video. Not necessarily bad, but just things that Not he quite just really doesn't need for, to be looking yeah. at. And so, and so, my wife has kind of put the the kibosh on the YouTubing. And uh, and I gotta say, like, it's like the new, it's like the new uh, cable channel TV for like kids. Right. It's like they're all over it. So guess what? Kyra's here with an app pick, and she's going to hook us up with a solution to prepare yourself. Want to let the little ones browse YouTube without worrying about what they're watching? I'm Kyra, and this is the Ting App of the Week. YouTube Kids is a new app on Android and iOS that includes curated videos, channels, and playlists that are perfect for young children. It's designed to give youngsters the freedom to choose the videos they want to watch, while avoiding the possibility of stumbling over those weird parts of YouTube. Nice. The app features a huge selection of popular titles, including Thomas the Tank Engine, Sesame Street, PBS Kids, Lego, and DreamWorks. From the homepage, kids can check out recommended channels for shows, music, learning, and exploring, or let them search for what they're interested in. YouTube automatically filters mature search terms to only display safe content. Tap the lock icon in the bottom right to access parental controls. Entering is as easy as tapping the numbers that are spelled out. Too easy, we might say, because if your child can read numbers, these restrictions aren't much use. Uh oh. Here's hoping Google releases a more secure passcode in the future. Using the parental controls, you can set a timer to limit screen time, disable the search feature, and more. If your child is already using YouTube, switch to YouTube Kids and rest easier knowing they can only access age appropriate content. Whether smartphone or tablet, Android or iOS, YouTube Kids is available to download for free. Check out the links in the description below. Thanks for watching and keep an eye out for more unboxings, app reviews, and Ting tips coming soon. Last.ting.com, last.ting.com. Noah, are you going to try it out or are you still just going to ban YouTube outright? Yeah, I, well, it's, it, it wasn't me that banned YouTube, so I guess, uh, I guess I'll pass it on to my wife. And <laughs> you let the advisory board here's know. The <laughs> well, here's, here's the thing. It's, it's one of those things where she's with him in public more than I am, so really it's her that has to pay the consequences if he, if he repeats something no kidding. or says something no inappropriate. Kidding. Well said. Yeah. And not to, mention, not to mention, for some reason, it's more socially acceptable if, if, if a child says something that's, that's slightly off-color when he's with dad than, than when it's with mom. I, I don't know exactly why that I've is, but that it, it seems like she gets... She she gets harsher criticism yeah. than I do. So, so you let her make that I, call. Uh, that's just, good. That's yeah, good. Yeah, I just roll with the punches. Last.ting.com. Uh, check out the sharp Aquios crystal. You own a 278. Gorgeous screen. Unlocked. No contract. Ting GSM SIM card, $9 too. Very cool. Last.ting.com. Now, is that sharp? Is that running Lollipop yet? I don't know. Originally, it wasn't. It is. No, but it, I, uh, I, so I, one thing I do try to do is I make sure I never try to point out a show that does, or a phone that doesn't at least run like 4.4 or something hot and fresh. Maybe okay. not. Maybe, uh-huh. You know, the Lollipop thing, there's just so few phones in the Android world that right. actually run at this. Right. Eventually, I'll make that the benchmark, but I feel like it's too soon. It's too soon. Yeah. No, it is. It's not, it's not fair to, to judge things. But however... After using Lollipop, it's so hard to go back oh, to because it's can't. so much more polished. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it, it makes me uh, excited about the ways you can present Linux when I use Lollipop. Uh, or here's something that also gets me excited: the bad kind of excited. The way you can block Linux if you're Microsoft Windows 10 to make secure boot secure boot Alt OS lockout a reality. <laughs> what? Actually, I'm just trying to get everybody hyped up. Uh, Windows 10 hardware uh, agreements with OEMs will remove the requirement that you could disable secure boot. That's essentially what's happening here. So currently with uh, Windows 8, the OEM contract reads that you need to include secure boot and you need to include the ability to have it enabled or disabled. Microsoft, starting with Windows 10, is adjusting that verbiage to say, just have secure boot. I don't care after that. If you want to leave it turned on and they can't turn it off, that's your call, Acer. That's your call, Asus. And the big concern is it does make it harder to load alternative operating systems. Yeah, there are ways to load Linux. People have concerns that maybe that key would get pulled. But there's other operating systems, too, that would be much more difficult. I don't know where to come down on this quite yet, Noah, because to me, one of the greatest things about the x86 PC platform is its openness. The fact that I could, as Mm -hmm. a kid, install BIOS, I could install FreeBSD, I could install Linux, I could install Windows. 
Um, mm -hmm. That was a pretty big uh, component of my experimentation with uh, different operating right. systems and discovering that Linux was the one I liked the most. This doesn't necessarily mean that might ha might be prevented, but it could now. And you could start to see desktop PCs and maybe more in the cheaper ones, the lower end ones, going more like tablets, where it's locked right. to a specific OS. Are you worried about this? So playing devil's advocate, is it really Microsoft's responsibility to ensure that hardware vendors provide a way to unlock their hardware to be used with an operating system that might, you know, I, I, I get what you're saying. And obviously I would never ever purchase a computer that I wasn't able to shut secure boot off and install uh, my right. own operating system. Right. In fact, frankly, yeah. I think secure boot is the dumbest thing ever. However, I don't think that Microsoft, I don't think that it's, that there's anything natively wrong with Microsoft not requiring their hardware vendors or putting into their agreement that their hardware vendors need to provide a way to disable mm, that. I think I that that's like, something that's on the hardware, okay, hardware vendors. Okay, let's flip this around though. Uh, would you agree <laughs> that perhaps it should be on Google to ensure that Android OEMs make sure that they patch the device for two years. So when exploits come out for the Linux kernel, the underlying tools, or the Android operating system, they need to provide a security patch. Even if they don't bring you up to uh, 5.0, they need to mm -hmm. somehow backport fixes or something, long-term support that S for two years. Now, you could make the same argument. There's no reason Google has to force anybody to do that. But then again, as a good steward of an important platform, as somebody that has a very influential position in that platform, you might say it's incumbent upon them to do what's best for that ecosystem. And you could make that same argument right. here with Microsoft. Well, yes, it is not their responsibility technically. You could say it is incumbent to a healthy P uh, x86 PC ecosystem, which they benefit from greatly and have benefited from greatly, that Secure Boot doesn't right. go too far. I don't have a overall fundamental issue with Secure Boot in the right environments, you know, government, laptops, servers, wherever you think it might be appropriate for you. I don't have a major issue with it. But having Secure Boot across the PC industry, especially where I worry about devices like at Costco and Best Buy, aka people that would be fantastic Linux users but wouldn't be able to install it later on because that cheap PC came with Secure Boot, that is what I worry about a little bit, but we're not there yet. Right. And I mean, I, I want to be a little careful because I, I don't want to go too too far off the deep end because I'm essentially I'm arguing for something that I don't necessarily agree <laughs> with. Right. Like I'm, I'm arguing yeah. the backside of it just to just. To, but the re, but so I feel like you're comparing two different things. You're saying that Google should provide updates for for its platforms and 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 require yeah, those hardware fair, vendors right. to implement those. Yeah, you're right. Huh. Yeah, because Google is more directly a steward of the Android platform, whereas Microsoft right. is and not really a steward of the x86 ecosystem. Well, number one, number two. How does Microsoft? How, what explain to me what the benefit to Microsoft uh, of the x86 ecosystem to Microsoft is by not requiring people to use Windows? Microsoft only benefits if people are using Windows. Well, hold on now, hold on now, uh, hold on. What's to say? Fast forward five, ten years down the road, that it's Windows mm -hmm. that's getting locked out from being installed on these PCs. The same, just well, because Microsoft yeah. okay. is in a position of power today doesn't mean the same thing couldn't happen to them in the future. Or, uh, now, right. I, I really seriously doubt I this would ever saying. happen, but you could have a uh, vendor like System76. Sy I don't think they would do this, but what if System76 made it really hard to install Windows on their laptop one day using this technology? Right. I don't think they ever would, so, but a company in that kind of position could, and then Microsoft would be just as screwed as Linux is in this scenario. I, I suppose, but at the point at the point where Microsoft, nobody is. I don't think that there's a large customer base that will go out and purchase Microsoft Windows and install it on a computer that it didn't come already installed with Microsoft yeah. Windows installed, yeah. right? Yeah, I don't probably. think that there's a large Today. customer base. Yeah. So, well, I mean, if if Microsoft ever gets to the point where they're relying on people to proactively go out buy the Microsoft operating operating system and then install it onto their computers i think that's we're really I think good that at that we're point doing good. well we're doing really good i think at that point they would want to reconsider their business strategy and look <laughs> at uh, getting their money from somewhere else yeah, because fair enough, fair I, enough. I just don't think they're i just don't think that that's a viable business model this for them. is and I, this but tell me and then we'll get off this cuz you, you know you really can't make a, too big of a deal out of this yet i really want to underscore that but the, right. I, I, I tell you what is I was reading through the internet comments, I, which I'd never recommend you do. I was reading through the internet comments on this story, and Noah, tell me if this doesn't resonate with you. You know what somebody said? They said if this goes too far, that could actually mean it's easier to install Linux on a MacBook than it is an x86 standard yeah. PC. And that yeah. that's a little yeah, creepy, how, right? How yeah, how ridiculous how ridiculous. And 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 the and it's it's a it's a shame because we're finally getting to a point 
where x86 hardware is becoming so inexpensive. You can buy a brand new desktop, a yeah. brand new desktop at Best yeah. Buy for like 200 and some dollars. You can yeah. buy the Intel, the Intel Nook would never do something like that. But the Intel Nook is, you know, $130, I think is, is what they're selling for now. You can buy a laptop. I saw they have this. Have you seen those HP stream yeah. uh, laptops? It's like a 13 inch laptop. They're like $200. Or Chromebooks. I mean, it's, well, yeah, Chromebooks too, but Chromebooks have that weird BIOS issue where it loses yeah. all the stuff and you have yeah. to, you know, weird. But um, you can, I mean, we, we are right at this precipice where we have all these really amazing x86 hardware stuff right. that is just coming out. And right. then at the same time, now we have this get unleashed that, that could and potentially like, stop people. But Rock Theory is saying in the IRC, like, you know, this could end up where it's like rooting a phone, you know, to get access to your device where you have to go in there. and That's you ridiculous. Know. I mean, and I don't know if it's going to get to that point. And, you know, maybe that's why it's a good thing we talked about this now. So it never does get to that point. Uh, right. But, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't think it's in Intel's best interest either. They have a lot of skin in the game with Linux. So I don't yeah, think. Yeah, no, no, very much not so. And I, I want to reiterate, if, in case this was missed previously, I obviously do not think that we should have vendors locking into Windows. I'm very much against that. Okay. I very much want people to be able to install Linux. And I personally will never, ever purchase, if I ever find out that a given hardware manufacturer, like HP or Asus, or if, they, if they ever once, if I ever once find out that they are locking uh, the abilities to not remove secure boot on any one of their models, I will never buy a computer from that manufacturer yep. ever again. Appreciate it. And that's just one more reason why I'm going to continue to try to buy the devices that are uh, more and more and more speaking to those kind of causes that I believe in. Because like uh, Dan Gilmore wrote a little while ago, the technology I use reflects my value too. Uh, right. All right. Speaking of technology we use in reflecting values, not too surprising, but maybe a little disappointing. There has been some ho hoopla building up around the BQ Aquarius Ubuntu phone's kernel. Uh, some say it's a toxic mess, like the headline on Pharonix. Uh, in a blog post today, the Linux Android-based kernel used by Ubuntu on their first smartphone is difficult to find the official source tree, it, uh, the writer puts it. That's, I think it's Karsten Monk of the Mir Project and uh, Chief Research Engineer of Yala, which obviously a little bit of a conflict of interest there being a Chief Researcher of Yala. Uh, but overall, it appears to be a big mess. You can find out the details in the blog post. Um, now, uh, this kind of thing can happen, and uh, BQ is, and I have more information in the show notes, is kind of notorious for being difficult from getting source code, and they want to charge to give you access to like GPL source code. Uh, but to their credit, Canonical has uh, already responded, uh, David Pal uh, Palena, Palena, he says, hi all, some of you might have seen today's blog post uh, from the Mirror Project where they pointed to conflicting comments in the kernel sources of the Ubuntu phone uh, for BQ devices. We are working with BQ to understand the situation and planning to publish the final E4.5 Ubuntu edition sources next week. So they should be, you know, coming up pretty soon. We are confident that these will address any questions raised by the preview source tree. Thanks to everyone who expressed their concerns and patience as we resolve this. So a little disappointing that, you know, their first device runs into some GPL issues, Noah, but too, are you too surprised when you're working with vendors kind of like BQ? Is that kind of just the right. way it goes? Right. I think it's par for the course. Yeah. I think it's par for the course. And and the other thing is, too, is, uh, you know, it seems like everyone's on top of it. It seems like they're, they're working through it to, to get that stuff resolved. And so what more do you expect? I mean, and, you know, the other thing is, too, is look at the time, uh, the time frame that that all of this has transpired, the amount of time that they've gone from nothing to shipping a device, you know, so. Very true. Well, it feels like it took forever, but in reality, not really. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, friends of the show, DuckDuckGo, just uh, plunked down some money. They call it uh, their free open source software donations for 2015. They did 125000 U.S. dollars across five projects. Secure Drop. I'm a big fan of this one. You might have heard it if you've listened to the Unfilter show in the wake of Edward Snowden. They wanted to create, and also uh, some other folks like Aaron Swartz worked on this. Uh, uh, secure Drop is uh, so media organizations can securely share files for whistleblower submissions in a system that's not so complicated that they screw it up. Uh, I thought that was pretty good. They also uh, gave some money to the Electronic Frontier Foundation to support Privacy bad Badger, a browser add-on that stops advertisers and other third-party trackers. Of course, this is a good one, the GPG Tools Suite, $25,000 to the GPT Tools, uh, which uh, I guess is this one specifically for OS X, but maybe some of that code goes up stream. Also, uh, $25,000 to the Tails Project. Hoo -ah! That's not bad. That's not bad. And then uh, $25,000 to Girl Develop It GDI to support their upcoming open source mentor mentorship program. Uh, that's really cool. I love seeing companies that rely on Linux and open source to give back like this. It's really neat. And it's, you know, Google has well, Google Summer of Code. Right. And just imagine what would happen if every company that relied on open source solutions would have contributed Shoot. to, for example, SSL. I mean, would we have ever had that issue? Right. You know, if every... 
you know, if every company took that approach. And the the, the, the interesting thing about DuckDuckGo specifically, uh, I had my reserva- or I had my my own concerns originally when it came out, and it was funny. My dad, of all people, was the one that convinced me to use it because I told him about it, and he goes, "Oh, that's great! I want to dump Google." And he he like whole hog jumped into DuckDuckGo. And originally, I thought that is it going to give me the same search quality that I got with Google and this that and the other. And after watching him use it for a week, and I said, "So is it working for it?" He goes, "Oh, it's great." And now I, he he consequently kind of convinced me to switch. So and it's been a pleasant experience so far. Yeah, they have some neat they have some neat tools to use it. Uh, they have mm-hmm. some they have some like Bang JB. <laughs> Uh, all right, just a quick plug. Uh, I didn't get to ch- a chance to mention it earlier, and I wanted to make good on this. Own Cloud 1.8, uh, the, the desktop client, is released. And this one is uh, something that Noah and I keep an eye on because we use Own Cloud to sync some files. Nice things for those of us who are on the GNOME desktop or Unity or anything that uses Nautilus. Much better integration with Nautilus now. You can share files directly from within Nautilus. Uh, the desktop sharing functionality works by allowing users to create a public link for synced files via a new entry implemented in the right-click context menu. The link can be copied to the clipboard and shared with friends and accessed uh, immediately available. Other uh, highlights in the 1.8 include uh, performance and stability improvements, which is awesome. Uh, 1.8 improved uh, synchronization of files that are opened in other applications on the Windows OSs that have problems with open files. Support for more paralyzed requests. Hey, yeah! And high DPI support for Mac OS. Oh, come on, give me on Linux. Give it to me. As other lots of small improvements. I mentioned this because it's something that uh, Noah and I use a lot, have had some troubles with, but continue to like just use it and work with it because it's one of the projects I think is super important. And where have you right. at? Have you decided to go in with own cloud eight or what's yeah, I mean, so what I've done is I have a, I took my, I had shut my own cloud box down because I had some issues with it and it, it is now spun back up and I have own cloud eight on there. And I, I have, I'm, I'm trying to develop a system to where I can verify that uh, basically here's, here's the acid test for me. I need, between 1,000 and 2,500 files, I need some of those files to exceed six or seven gigs in size, and then I want all of those to be synced across 17 or 18 machines simultaneously with minor changes on any one machine throughout the day. Um, and that's that's my use case. And so if that works, then I can use the files. The, the problem I have right now is I have yet to f- figure out a way that I can definitively test that all 17 of those machines are showing consistent changes mm-hmm. and that I haven't lost any files and that more right. importantly, my bigger files haven't become corrupted, which yeah. is what the problem I had last time I used own cloud. Um, but the the reality is is that the potential for own cloud is so great. That's why I keep sticking with it. So mm-hmm. for example, when I send you video footage right now, we're using an FTP. I mean, mm-hmm. we're using 1993 technology mm-hmm. to do, there's gotta be a better way to do that. And things like own cloud, imagine this, imagine every time I was done with an interview, if I stuck the SD card into my laptop and automatically all of those files got synced up to an own cloud server and then my own cloud yeah. server talked to your own cloud server yeah. and then those got downloaded to your Bonobo. Yeah. So when you sat down, oh, look, there's there all there. the interview files That's, and there would be no I think we'll get there. transferring of I, th- I think we will yeah, get there. Right. And, and videos, you know, and maybe we just have a separate own cloud instance for production or something. I don't know, but mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. And that's kind of where I'm at, too. Hey, uh, something that we mentioned on Linux Unplugged at the top of the show on Tuesday because it was breaking, breaking news. But uh, it's worth mentioning now at the end of the news segment here on Last, too. I think it's a big deal. I know a lot of you aren't gamers like Noah's not a gamer. But Bioshock Infinite, now available for Linux. You're going to have to have proprietary graphics drivers. That's strike number one. Strike number two, the game is using that famous Eon wrapper. I don't know. I actually have not had a single performance issue on the couple of machines that I've tried it on, but uh, you're going to need to have NVIDIA 340.65 driver or Catalyst 1412 drivers. And it's about 30 bucks in the Steam store. Huge game. Really fun game. I really liked it. Now this is one more landmark. And the reason why, why do I mention it in the news? Because I actually think it's that big of a release, the fact that that's on Linux now. Just from somebody who's been doing this show for so long, looking back at this kind of mm-hmm. stuff, that is undeniably, if you would have told... 2008, Chris, that bio, games like Bioshock were being released on Linux, even if they were in Eon wrappers, I just, on Steam, on Steam, my mind would have been blown. I would have told, I would have said, you are crazy. You are crazy. I would have gone back to using KDE too. No, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, no. Steam would have been coming out of your ears. Yeah. Oh, but I'm pumped. Nice, sir. Well done. Well all done. Right. All right, that's all the news for this week. We're about to dig in and see if Cody is indeed the best open source home theater solution out there. But before we do that, I want to thank our segment sponsor, the folks over at System76. Head over to System76.com and get yourself a rig built, born, designed 
to run Linux and stop fighting with your hardware and play with your Linux. And they have some really cool stuff coming, too. So keep checking them out. Go to System76 and tell them the Linux Action Show sent you. Great laptops and some wicked, powerful desktops. Oh, that Leopard Extreme. Oh, you know, though, the Wild Dog performance, performer for us. Noah right there with all his North Dakota goodness calling in on a Wild Dog like a Mo. And it works perfectly for this. Also, I think that Rattel performance would make an excellent home theater PC. But keep an eye out. System 76 might have something that might make an even better home theater PC really soon. Uh, and... Uh, I, I, I have to say, the Bonobos. You know, somebody asked me on Twitter recently how the Bonobos treated me. I think I got that 2013, 2012. I don't know. It's still such, such a powerhouse with its dual SSD goodness that uh, I just thought, I love it. It's my daily driver. Hey, Noah, guess what? <coughs> we decided what. it was time to really take a serious look at Cody Media Center, which famously is probably maybe even better known as XBMC or maybe lesser known right. as Xbox Media Center. Uh, and and truth be told, it's one of the favorites in our audience. So it's an area that when we go mm -hmm. into this, we know we're we are touching um, sacred sacred ground here, and we are going to try to be gentle with your sacred ground because not only are we fans of the project, but we're also familiar with some of the folks who work on it, and we're, we we respect the hell out of them. And I was looking mm -hmm. at something that would be great for two things, Noah. Uh, number one is you know that old uh, XBS uh, thirteen that I uh, stole from you. Right. Yeah. I was thinking uh, I should take that and put XBMC on that and make it a, po a portable, like, Jupyter Broadcasting portfolio. So, like, we go to a fest, and it downloads all the latest five episodes of each show, sets up a randomized playlist or something like that, and plays it or something. That's what I wanted to go for. So I set that XBS uh -huh. uh, 13, the uh, not the new one that just came out recently, but, like, the first Sputnik edition laptop that Noah's uh, been letting me right. borrow since, like, Linux Fest, Ohio, or where... I don't remember. Right. I don't remember. Somewhere around there. Yeah. Uh, and so I put Cody Ubuntu, or Cody Butu, Cody Butu on mine, which is, as you probably guessed, it is uh, Cody running on top of an Ubuntu base, ready to go. And we were trying out the 14.2 release, which is currently in release candidate. And it's going to be out really soon, so we thought, we'll go ahead and talk about this. It's got some good bug fixes in there. It's pretty stable, and it's probably the one you're going to be running for a while. And the reason for that is, version 15 is just around the corner, and it's a pretty big new version. So... As of right now, the Linux Action Show is recommending that if you're going to do a Kodi deployment, you go with 4.2 Final when it comes out and stick with that for a while. It should be a good release for a long time. Give 15 a little while to cook. So with that in mind, this review will primarily focus on Kodi 4.2, and then towards the end of the review, I'll pull up my Kodi 15.0 review, uh, installation and give you a quick look at that too so you can see what's coming up. Uh, and now, Noah, I know you've got it installed over there. Why don't you get yours set up uh, <clears throat> while well, I'll go over a couple of the features in Kodi 14.2 four, uh, that people might be interested in. Uh, one of the things that I like a lot, going back to the demo thing, maybe even for podcasts, gapless MP3 support has been added to this. Multipath source scanning has been added. I think that's really nice. If you have uh, the need for uh, subtitles, external uh, subtitle support in some cases has been added. That's very, very nice. Lots of fixes to the PVR add-on. Some playbacks for that... Uh, Windows operating system, but a big one for the Jupyter Broadcasting audience. Support for the RTMP protocol, which means you could watch natively now without even having to have an app. But there is a Jupyter Broadcasting app for Cody. But with even out, even needing an app, you would be able theoretically to watch our our JB Live RTMP stream in XBMC. I don't know exactly how that works, but they are adding that in 14.2. Uh, so that was one of the things I was excited about. So if you're watching the video version right now, what you are seeing from North Dakota is. Noah's XBMs, or I'm sorry, old habit, Cody setup. And Noah, do you want to walk us through this? Yeah. So let me start. Uh, let me start about where I was at. Um, I was pre previously using the Western Digital TV Live, and why I like those devices is because they allow me to simply purchase a forty nine dollar, fifty dollar device that I can sticky to the back of the TV mm. with HDMI, <laughs> and then I instantly have access to all of my media because all it requires to work is a uh, file server. It doesn't yeah. require any media Just a Samba backend, share, like right? Plex, and that's, right, right. Well, Samba share NFS. Cool. 
and that's one of my that's one of my primary complaints about Plex is it requires one other server that I have to run, one other server that I have to maintain. And I don't watch movies when I'm traveling. Anytime I'm traveling, I want those movies stored or TV shows rather stored locally. Right. And I understand that Plex has a sync feature, but if you take a look at even what happened to Angela when you guys were coming to Ohio, um, you guys had some issues with that. And so if those files were just stored on my phone, I wouldn't have those issues. So that's what I was going after was a simple way that I could I could re replace the Western Digital because even if I have to push Linux sideways up a hill, I'd rather use it <laughs> than a proprietary solution, right? So I installed... Um, I installed Cody, and here's what I found. Okay. Um, first of all, the UI is super snappy, and this is running on like a seven-year-old computer, so it's not terribly, it's not a terribly fast machine, and Intel Nook would probably do a much better job. But you can see all of my movies are stored in ISOs, and the reason I like that is because I get the original DVD menu structure uh, that I had when I purchased the DVD. So there's literally nothing that I'm missing from actually having the DVD. And so I don't feel bad about not, ha if I, if I get rid of those DVDs or something, you know, they're, they're backed up essentially. Um, so I like the fact that it was snappy. I like the fact that as soon as I clicked on the ISO, it instantly opens and starts playing things. I didn't like, um, you, this overlay thing, one, right? Huh? Well, the over, okay. So the overlay is, is starts. Is, is, so the is video started, continues is a, to is play in the background when you bring up the Kodi interface. I think it's now kind that, of slick. that I don't mind. Okay. Yeah, that I don't mind. But what I didn't like was notice I have to come up here to this menu bar yeah. to stop the film. Yeah. Okay. There shouldn't be a way to do that. The escape function I would assume would or the back button would get me out of the video. It doesn't happen that now, way, keep right? In mind, I think that's a little. Keep in mind, <clears throat> if you had a remote, you would probably just hit the stop button on the remote. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's true. I didn't, and I I ordered an IR thing, but it isn't here yet. Yeah. Second of all, I don't like this drop down thing. I don't understand why we have to have like when I go to videos. Why do I, my my cursor would get stuck on, ah. on files or, or add ons, and I would go into that. I, so, I feel like it's it's needlessly complicated. Let's let's break let's break the order. Let's. So this is in fourteen two. Uh, here in fifteen zero is something they're going to fix a little bit. So this is my ex mm -hmm. this is my Kodi installation. This is my fifteen zero installation. Okay. And one of the things you notice is that drop down looks a little bit different now. Files, library, and add ons. I think this is a good differentiation. Uh -huh. So files is like you just want to straight up browse files, right? You get that. And right. library is where your metadata comes into play. And I think that's really nice too, because then I get the metadata version. And here's why that matters. I can go movies. Of course, I clicked on TV shows. But you can go to TV shows, and then I can do genres, right? Action. And now I'm, br now I'm browsing based on metadata instead of by files. So I think it makes a little more sense the way they lay it out in version 15. The other thing they do in version 15 is you also have this secondary area here, which is just movies. Straight up, there's my movies, and it just drops me right to right. my movies. This is really nice, yep. too, uh, because... For the spousal effect, for the spousal approval factor, I'm in and I'm starting my movie way faster this way, right? And that's that for her is going to be a big. I better turn that off before we get pulled down. But that for her is going to be a big deal. Uh, and so I like in 15.0 they've sort of addressed your complaint there, Noah. And uh, and, yeah. and you can see you in movies you can right here from this drop down screen choose right title genre year right there. And same with uh, TV shows yeah. and all of that. Yeah, very, very much so. The other thing I didn't like was there. There is no. Uh, there's no video preview. So for, or at least for, uh, I, I guess I tried it with. I tried it with AVIs. I tried it with an MKV, and I tried it with my ISOs, and. Um, when I would highlight over a video, it would there's a little box that would show me a you know a, a, ca a still capture, but it wouldn't right. start it wouldn't pre live preview the video, which my Western Digital does, and I think that's really useful. Especially in the when menu, I'm going you get to, you can live preview the video in the Western Digital menu. Yeah. So as I'm scrolling through, let's say I'm watching a TV cool. show, right? Yeah. And I and I think to myself, uh, which episode did I leave off on? Was it 13, 14, or 15? I can start at 13. I scroll down to it. It starts playing. Nope, I saw that one. 14. Nope, I saw that one. 15. No, and, and it cuts through. It's even smart enough to cut through, you know, like if they have the little intro where the Fox logo slide. No, it, it cuts all past that and starts right at the beginning of the episode. If they have the previously on this episode, it cuts through all that crap and goes right to the beginning of the episode, which and I've really, really come to rely on that, you know, when I'm going <laughs> yep. through TV shows. And yep. so not only does Cody, it doesn't, I feel like that's a, that would have been a very simple feature to implement, and they were missing it. And then lastly, and my biggest complaint, and this was a, this was a huge gripe, I was pretty upset about this, I had it installed on a box that I, I wanted to plug it into my TV so I could actually see what it would look like in the living room. Well, I don't have network jack running up to the living room um, in my in my in my living room, and so I was going to connect it to my Wi-Fi network, which is easy to do on the sure, Western Digital sure. or Plex or anything else. So I go to connect it to the wireless and can't find a menu anywhere to connect it to wireless, or you know an interface to do that. So and this I, is I using jump in the, the Kodi Ubuntu, right? 
So I jump into the chat room and I said, hey guys, uh, I was interested in, in doing this. How do I do this? And everyone, everyone said, well, you can, use, uh, you can use WPA Supplicant or you can use NMCLI. That is not an answer. That's not an answer at all. That, in fact, that's the opposite of an answer. That, that is an answer for a, for, a, for a science project that I'm doing to, to see that, that I can connect to a wireless. That is not an actual implementable solution. I cannot go into my house and tell my wife, hey, uh, sweetie, um, anytime you want to connect to the network, when you buy these boxes, all you have to do is uh, push control alt f one you'll drop down to a terminal, log in as this user, and then, no, that's not going to happen. And more importantly, I can't sell that to other people. I can't go into some, somebody's house when we're doing home theater installation and they say, we bought a new router and we've changed our our uh, our uh, our network name and I say oh that's no problem here just let me SSH into your box and come <laughs> on really yeah. we can't put a little icon that's that has a little wireless thing and we can't click on that like we can't do that that's really that that hard and and nobody nobody and I talked to a couple different people and not one person said hey you know what that's right that that that's that you know that's lacking you know somebody should do something about that everyone had an answer of why we don't need to be able to connect to wireless networks with the, with an icon? I just find it ridiculous. Well, let um, me uh, let me say this. So uh, there is there is that element where when you go outside the walled garden, there's sometimes a mixed community response. I've noticed that too. But on the flip side, to kind of put the to kind of paint the community in a different light. So there is that sort of troubleshooting element to it that's a little hit and miss. And the other thing that makes it difficult is there's a very 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 wide range of the type of hardware people are running Kodi on from Raspberry Pis mm -hmm. to Windows PCs. So there's right. a lot of different ways to do things and a lot of different tools. But so the community can be a little fractured there. <clears throat> but where they really rock, Noah, and you can see this in your version as well as in uh, v version 15.0, is uh, add-ons that are built by the community. Right. This is truly yep. where Kodi... So here, I'll go into this add-on section. So I have a couple installed right here. Uh, so I have uh, Jupiter Broadcasting and Popcorn TV installed. I can say Get More. It pulls down a library here. Like, here's the Linux Gamecast. I can go in and... Oh, no. I'm using the touchscreen, by the way, which works pretty well. Uh, I can go in here and say Linux Gamecast. I can install this... Uh, extension or i'm sorry this add-on see it downloads it there mm -hmm. and installs the add-on and now i can go in there and i can do i can watch their videos i can same with uh jupiter broadcasting here's the uh, jupiter broadcasting app and here's our most recent episodes uh and here's like uh, here's tech talk today this is in picture this. this is on this is this is you know you're on your couch right you're sitting back right good morning it's friday march 20th 2015 cool. hey look oh my gosh today, that's me and, and this is me and that's the logo of me and i'm angela look at that oh, angela, good <laughs> look at that to you. <laughs> We have a oh, meta. That's only really fun for those of you watching the video, but so and before you get uh, before we get too far off of this, um, uh, essentially, you know, it, you, I can understand what, what what you're coming from when you say you know it's on Windows, it's on Raspberry Pi. Fine if I'm installing the XPMC app, but when I download the dedicated ISO. I expect to be able to use that out of the box without having to add anything else. And connecting to a wireless network in 2015 is something that is should just be a given. Yeah. That's not something that yeah, I, I, I should have to look outside or I, I should have how, to add some additional I don't know how official to you can count that that spin, uh, and that's part of the problem. Um, and there's you know there's other there's, there's other there's other spins out there that come with Cody's pre setup. Uh, so mm -hmm. set the wireless aside for a second. Assume somebody could come along with a distro that smooths that over. Overall, like experience using Kodi, spousal approval factor, right. comparison to things like. So you're comparing it to the Western Digital, which runs Linux, by I the am. way. I'm comparing it, it to a Roku, which also runs Linux using Plex, though, on top of that, which is right. not open source. Uh, so those are our, our points of comparison. Where does Kodi right. fit in that lineup for you? So for me, uh, I will continue, it, much like OwnCloud, I will stay dedicated to Kodi until the problems that I have either get resolved or I just find workarounds to get around them. Because I'm not going to, we've gotten to a point now where I can use a Linux solution um, to, you know, a, a, a more native and a more community inspired Linux solution. I'm not going to go away from that. Um, it is to a point where I can put it into my house and, and do an actual quote unquote deployment. And what that's going to involve is I need, we have universal remotes that control everything in the house. And then there's little IR blasters that stick onto them. And then the remote talks RF to a control station downstairs. And then that sends a signal through wires to little IR blasters that stick on the individual things that control. So I need to be able to control it from IR. The IR receiver is on the way. I ordered it. I was hoping to get oh, it cool. on Saturday. Didn't yeah. get it on Saturday, so That's it'll right. be here on Monday. Um, so once that gets here, the UI is snappy. Uh, what I will do is I, I tried using it on Android devices and I had mixed results, but I don't really have a powerful enough Android device to really definitively say it doesn't work 
uh, very well on Android. All I can say is I didn't have a very good experience of it. So what I'm looking at doing is buying something either like an Intel Nook or another small, uh, a very small x86 powered device, and I'll put those uh, those IR devices or that IR receiver in there, and I think I will be able to replace uh, my Western Digital Lives because the thing I don't like about the Roku, the thing I don't like, not this isn't so much a hit on Plex as it is the Roku. I don't like things that require authentication services. If mm. you buy a Roku, the first thing you have to do is go to Roku site and type in the little code to activate the box. And if Roku ever went out of business, all of your little hockey pucks are useless, and I don't like that. And, and then and then adding to that, you add the Plex layer on top of it. Now I have to have a Plex server that has to be running and has to work for me to get my media. And I feel like just to play movies in my house, that shouldn't be necessary. I should just be able to just point it to a folder where all my movies, all my music, all my videos are, and it should just play those. I feel like that's a very simple thing to do. Obviously, when you want to do things like get it on your phone and and have, you know, um, the ability to sync your, your where the last place you watched and, and tabulate all that stuff, obviously then that's, I think, where Plex shines. Um, but for what I'm doing, especially, we have, we put a lot of money into a home theater downstairs. If I'm watching a movie, it's in a, it's in a box with a hardwired connection in a yeah, specific right. room that sits that's literally what I a couple say. feet from my file server. Right. There's no reason I need to transcode or anything like that. I hardwire whenever I'm watching anything high definition. I do a hard hardwired connection too. Mm-hmm. Uh, right. So I'm 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 fascinated. So from my perspective, what Cody needs to do for me is sort of like a portable portfolio, and I think uh, it absolutely could live up to that. Could it be my home entertainment system? Maybe. Mm-hmm. I definitely re- really really want all of those additional add-ons that I just don't get on the other media platforms are right. just better. Some of them maybe skirt outside the, the the law or in the gray zone, but that's kind of why I want them, and they're not available on other platforms. I'm going to be honest with you right there. <laughs> there may be a sweet spot for me. Uh, Troy in our chat room has uh, linked me up to Plex XBMC, which is a Plex right. add-in for XBMC, or Cody in this case. I've heard of it before, mm-hmm. and you know what? I think I'm just going to give it a try. I think I'm going to give it a go and see how it works right. here at the studio. So I'll hook it up here at the studio, play with it here, and then kind of get a little taste of it and then maybe move it home as it goes. It's play, browse and replays and, and resumes stuff that you play in the Plex media software, which is a key feature for right. my kids. It has all the metadata from the Plex library. Uh, you can delete media from the Plex server. It has my Plex account support for remote Plex media servers. That might do right. it, Noah. And here's the, yeah, well, here's the thing. It, it, it's, it's much like the Android discussion we were having earlier. You use the you use Plex on top of Cody. If anything ever happens to Plex, if the if the if the rug ever gets pulled out from Plex and I, it's gaining steam, not losing it, so I don't know why that would happen. But if that ever happened, then all you lose is the fancier features of local playback. You can still play your media because you just point it to a folder and you can continue on. Sure. And the other nice thing is it frees my biggest complaint, my biggest, my hard line in the sand is the Roku. I really, really don't like the fact that I have to activate those devices and that. That concern just got uh, totally blown up on me when I, I was working for a client, and they they ordered this software that was seventeen thousand dollars per copy. Ooh. They had I think twenty or twenty five copies of it, and the way it was authenticated was this little USB key stuck in the back, and then there was a serial number that popped up on the screen. You called the company, you read the number, and they gave you a return number. You typed it in, right? And so the USB had to be present, and the um, company had to be you know working. And they didn't go out of business, but what they said was they said uh, the because they are no longer supporting that version of the software, you had to either pay for the newer version of the software or they wouldn't activate the old one. And it just, I was filled with so much rage, it's mm-hmm. indescribable, that, that we, they'd spent all this money, uh, they'd spent all this money on the software, and they can't even use the software they paid for because, the, I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm not a lawyer, but that doesn't even seem legal to me, that you can, that you can pay for, for a software. And they're not asking for support. They're not asking them to fix any problems. They're simply asking them to use the software that they paid for. And so when, stuff, when I see stuff like that happen, and you see companies that, that come and go, they go out of business, it makes me wonder is what happens if anything ever happens to the Roku company? Are, you know, the, the, then those boxes become useless. And I, so uh, this, is it's a nice filler solution. You you you're yes. able to still use Plex, but you do it on hardware that you yes. own with software that you put on there, and of course, powered by Linux. Who doesn't love that? I uh, I right. don't <clears throat> I don't particularly worry about something like with Roku happening because I would just replace it with some other box pretty quickly. So it's not like it's a big deal for me because I really I I, I see those boxes having a two to three year life cycle as it is. So if the as long as the company lasts, well, what would you replace years, it with though? Whatever is probably hot at the time. I mean, I mean, seriously, Cody on maybe a Raspberry Pi is becoming a possibility. So while you were talking, uh-huh. I installed the Plex 
XBMC add-on, and it's already connected huh. up to our Plex server here at the studio, and it's already pulling in uh, uh, all of our uh, all of our metadata from our Plex server. I didn't I didn't do anything mm-hmm. else other than just install the add-in while you were talking, and I've I'm already mm-hmm. interoperating with the Plex server, and it's already doing what I want. So for me, yeah, I think uh, this is a pretty usable solution. And it makes me, you right. know, it also makes me think we could have like a Jupiter Broadcasting demo Plex server up on a DigitalOcean droplet that this thing would just connect to on the laptop. I wouldn't even have to have local right. media on the laptop, as long as I yeah. went to a but place to do the demo. Though. Yeah, and imagine this: you can use this on your Amazon Fire TV because it runs Android. You can use it on your phone because it runs Android. You can use it on any piece of x86 hardware because you can install uh, Kodi. You can use it on on any ARM-based hardware because they. I mean, the uh, ability to to scale hardware is amazing one of the biggest one of the minor gripes i had with the western digital was when we would use them in home theater installations we'd have these nice looking racks that they've spent a lot of money on and everything would look perfect except you'd have the western digital live this tiny little box sitting on a one u shelf that had all this black space around it that you could see to the back of the rack and it looked ugly and we would talked about getting custom rack plates to put in front of it and stuff like that and nothing ever came to rotation the nice thing about this is you can stick it in a one u enclosure you can put a tiny little they have those little atom boards um Actually, I probably wouldn't use an atom board because the fan they get hot, and so you have to have a lot of fans. But you put a little one u uh, one u enclosure uh, one u uh, computer bo- uh, um, computer case and stick a motherboard in there and install this. And that that would be a great media center. Um, it'd be a great solution, and it'll look nice in the rack. So, yep. uh, I like I said, I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to stick with it until uh, until they either fix the problems yeah. or I find ways to work around them. Yeah, I say it's ready to go at JB One, uh, and uh, I may I may roll it out at back at uh, the homestead. Uh, <clears throat> probably for the next, probably for the next box. The thing is, the add-ons are what keep me. The compatibility with Plex, I'm going to play with that some more here at the studio. And as long as that seems to be as solid as it does, just in my t- just dorking around right there, it- it's a pretty awesome solution. Also, 15 is looking particularly good. No, I know you tested it on an Android device or two and had some issues with playback, right? Four. I tested it on four Android devices. I tested it on my Samsung S4. I tested it on a Galaxy. Note, I get tested it on a, on a what's the what's the um, the better one that they have? They have the Note and then the, the, tab. the big tablet Tab, the Galaxy Tab, <laughs> Tab ten point one, and I tested it on the Nexus nine, and all of those uh, I could not get it to uh, to open my ISOs. Even and on I the don't nine, know, I, yeah. Well, and here's the thing though. Here's the thing. They, uh, I t- when I talked to the Cody guys, I believe, and I could be mistaken about this, but I'm pretty sure they actually showed me it opening. ISOs, which leads me to think I may have a Kodak issue that has to be resolved or installed or something like that. I don't think it's a limitation of Kodi. I think it's a limitation of my intelligence. But the the but I I wasn't able to. I would have loved to bring it in and say, look, it works here on this Android device. And if that had been the case, the answer would be simple because there are tons of Android <laughs> based devices that with HDMI that you just plug in the back yeah. of the TV. I would love to use something like that. Yeah. But I don't have the confidence in it quite yet because I haven't got it to work. But once I get the issue sorted out, like I said, firmly believe it's an issue of my brain power not an issue of limitation of Cody. I, uh, I I was even thinking like the Ouya or something like that would make a maybe an, an interesting uh, Cody uh, device. Uh, yeah, you know mm-hmm. we have a uh, we have an interview you did that I th- I think I'll, I'll see if I can play it during the next segment break. Maybe we'll throw it in the outtakes where they talk about the device compatibility. So uh, specifically yep. around that, one of the things and the reason why I brought it up. Uh, so looking forward to version 15 of Cody, which is. Uh, in beta right now. And 14.2 is going to be the one that's going to be probably pretty solid for a while. But looking ahead at 15.0, we do know a few things that are going to go into 15.0. And one of the things they're going to do is they're going to have a lot of work on that Android uh, HEVC decoding for uh, H.264 and additional chipsets to get hard more hardware encoding. Uh, de- or I'm sorry, actually decoding. They're also going to FFmpeg 2.54, which will also improve performance quite a bit. Uh, so version 15 may resolve some of your issues, and part of version 15 uh, of Kodi will also, if you're going to be on Android, require that you're on uh, 4.2 Jelly Bean, and uh, <clears throat> it's also going to bump the requirements for uh, Mac and Windows, I think, as well. Pretty much on Linux, you're good as long as you have the current FFmpegs and any modern kernel. Uh, but yeah, so that'll be, they're also doing, they're also doing uh, some nice improvements to the uh, jump forward and back and support for mobile uh, iOS devices as well. And the add-on support is, seems to be pretty rocking, too. I was able to get the 14 version add-ons to work okay, and 15, the ones I've tried so far. Is there any other notes you want to touch on before we uh, wrap it up? I just have a couple of things to no. point people towards. 
Okay. No, I, I mean, just, you know, I, I had, I had, there, 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 there were some problems. I had some issues that I'd like to see resolved, but overall I thought that, uh, I was highly impressed. I, mean, I think part of it was I went into it with really high expectations because previously I had very low expectations. And then after talking to the Cody guys and like he would pull device after device, he'd pull the Nvidia shield out and be look running ice. Uh, you can open an ISO on this device here. You can do it on this. Okay. I, I, and every problem I had, they had a solution for. So I kind of went into it expecting everything to work flawlessly was, out of the box. Yeah. No problems. I'm like this project has really evolved and I think what I felt I think part of it was I just I just don't have the know-how to solve my own problems do you think in the short amount of time that I tried to, to do. And, and I think it probably comes off a little unfair a little negative but overall it was it was a positive experience and I'm gonna stick with it until I get it to work yeah and do you think maybe he was showing you a dev build you know what here's what we'll do is I'll look for that Could clip be. I'm pretty sure I have it and I'll see if we can get Rika to put it in the outtakes so that way people can see that yeah. you can talk about the device compatibility with the uh, Cody developer because mm -hmm. you're at the booth at scale with the, with the Cody guys okay so I just have a couple things I want to point to people in the show notes so I think both of Noah and I are saying yeah Cody is getting really good and uh uh, if you haven't checked in since it's been XBMC like us, that's kind of one of the reasons we we're checking back. It's definitely worth a revisit. The add-ons are just as cool as ever. Uh, so here's a couple of points. There's some really good how-to instructions for just about all major versions of Linux, uh, including uh, uh, PPA to make it really easy to install on top of an existing Ubuntu installation. Dead simple to get it set up. But if you want it even simpler than that, there is the distro that, that Noah was talking about. That had some of the Wi-Fi setup issues, uh, the Kodi Ubuntu or whatever it's called. Linked, we linked that up in the show notes. You guys can go check that out. I've also got the Arch Wiki uh, guide linked up to get it installed on Arch, which is very easy to do, including version 15. You can build it from the AUR. It installs uh, without any issues for me. Uh, we have all of that stuff linked up in the show notes. Go check it out and uh, see what your experiences are with Cody, and then go over to linuxactionshow.reddit.com and share your feedback and your reviews of it if it's been a while since you've checked it out and uh, how it compares to things like Plex and other devices you've used. And uh, maybe we'll share that in uh, this week's episode of Linux Unplugged. But that, Noah, is the Linux Action Show's look at Cody. <laughs> And that brings us to the end of this week's program. But, Noah, before we get the heck out of here, we do have a little bit of email to get to. And uh, the first one comes up from Zlatatantan. That's actually his name. And he has an email about 3D animation software. He said, back in episode 352, you talked about the Lego movie and the 3D software they used to make it. From the look of it, I believe it was Soft Image by Autodesk. And... It's discontinued. Alternatives also by Autodesk are Maya, which we know of, and Mudbox. Maya is an animation 3D modeling, and Mudbox is like a digital clay for sculpting. Both work on Red Hat, Fedora, and CentOS. Only problem is cost. $3,600 and $495, respectively. No, it's not in any repo either, but they're the best and used by the gaming and movie industry. You heard of either one of those? You've probably heard of Maya. And Mudbox? Yeah, yeah, of course. Here's here's what was super exciting to me about this piece of feedback. This is this is uh, see this is this is a perfect example of me admitting when I'm wrong about something. So uh, back in that episode, what I said was I was I was disappointed that we always get these runs Linux and they're always some custom software that's in Hollywood, but it's not available to the rest of us. And as it turns out, I'm totally wrong. It is available to the rest of us. I mean, it has a high price tag. But it is available, and you can purchase it, and you can run it on Linux. And it's not some custom-made solution just for Hollywood. It's you know, it's put out by this company, and you you can purchase it and run. It. I mean, if you wanted to, if you had you know, extra ten thousand dollars to to throw down on it. Um, but that's really cool, right? And the fact that Autodesk. Uh, is is producing the software makes me wonder how long before things like AutoCAD yeah, buddy. get ported over to Linux and keep dreaming huh? big. Keep and dreaming here's big. here's what's great about that. One of one of my good friends is a civil engineer, and he the only thing he runs on his very very expensive HP workstation at work is AutoCAD. And I I've talked to him at length, and I said you know if that came out for Linux, would you guys switch? And he goes in a heartbeat because all of the problems we have are rarely with AutoCAD. It's always the underlying operating system that it hangs up or it crashes. And he goes one thing that we were so happy with Autodesk is they have a really great auto uh, uh, save uh, auto save recovery feature, so that when Autodesk when AutoCAD crashes like four times a day or five times a day or whatever it is he's doing, he goes, I can uh, I can when I pull it back up, it has all my projects saved, so I yeah. don't lose them. Yeah. And um, their IT department want, doesn't want to invest in in newer hardware, and so they they've run into some limitations. But um, they would switch to Linux, and I so I think that it's a it's a really positive and encouraging thing. We'll and I'm happy to admit they've been that I was wrong. They've with you it can... for a long time, though. We're uh, right, uh, but they're they're making the software. I mean, some of their software is running on. 
analytics. Yeah. So how long before they go, well, this is working well. Maybe we can do this industry. And The question and, is, and, is you know, how stupid down? are they? How dumb are they? How long yeah, until yeah. what is obvious and been smacking them in the face like a wet right. noodle becomes apparent to them and they just do the rest of it? That's really right, what you should be right. asking because I don't know. I don't know yeah. how stupid they are. No, I can't tell you that. I think they're yeah. pretty stupid based on I, how long I, it's been. I, I, pretty I, stupid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, it, it took it took them a long time to to get there, but I think we're moving in the right direction. So I'm gonna, yeah, I'll stay uh, I'll stay positive. Hey, about that. Gary wrote in about ham uh, radio. You should probably take this one. He did. He writes. I uh, uh, should pull up the right feedback. Uh-huh. He says, <clears throat> "Thanks for last 356 ham radio segment. I've been a ham radio operator since 1963 and a Linux fan since 2000 or so. I will be 66 years old later this year and love Linux and open source software. Just wanted to mention that the broadband hamnet stuff is slowly starting to take off, and ah. it's evolving a lot. Originally, users were using old Linksys routers. Hey, there's nothing wrong with those w, uh, WRT54Gs, um, which would put a lot of BBHN firmware on. Then they would SSH into the routers and set up servers for chat, file transfer, and other mm. things. Mm. Now they have found the Ubiquity company, which has some really great routers, and have mounted right on the 2.4 gigahertz antennas, and also some 900 megahertz. These routers and antennas can be set up with the BBHN firmware and have a lot more space and capability. They are relatively inexpensive, some under $100. They can be accessed and powered by hooking up CAT6 Ethernet cable, thus eliminating huge signal loss inherent with coax feed lines. Ha <laughs> Also, they can handle setting up servers, email, video, audio, etc. Just about anything you could want to do on the internet. It's exciting, especially for emergency and use in all sorts of situations. By the way, you mentioned that LinPSK is also available on Linux. One of the top uh, digital programs used by ham radio operators in is FLD Digi, which I, I, I actually hadn't seen that one. Which is also available on Linux. The source hey, code oh. and binaries can be downloaded at, and he gives us the link. It's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. FL Digi is not only does PSK, but supports scores of other digital modes that are exceedingly better. Uh, I've never played with any of the other digital modes. So, um, while PSK is by far more common, it is best suited for strong signals and good band conditions and short QSOs. Many other modes are handy and perform more accurately, especially under adverse conditions. I've been making my own custom version of FL. Digi for years now since it's open source. I compile it on Mint Linux and compile a Windows version using Ming W. Hmm. Thank goodness for open source and Linux. Anyway, I just started watching last few months ago, and you guys are by far the Linux uh, best Linux podcast I have ever seen. Thanks again for the great ham radio segment, and hope to catch you on the HF bands for a QSO. 73 is Gary, WB8 ROL. Well, thanks, Gary. And uh, I appreciate the uh, I appreciate the the update on the ham radio net. That is a super exciting thing. If you recall, Chris, that's essentially where you can make your own modem out of a ham radio and connect with essentially a peer-to-peer, a true peer-to-peer network that requires nothing in between. And you can connect to everyone else that has a ham radio modem and essentially you establish your own mesh, network, which mesh net that kind of? honestly would be my fail-bake plan if yeah. anything ever happened yeah. with uh, SOPA. So yeah. it's cool to get that written in and see that that's taking off. Yeah, that is really neat. Uh, thank you, Gary, for uh, writing that in. Uh, this week, I, I caught a couple of really, really helpful threads on the Linux Action Show subreddit. And uh, I really wanted to kind of uh, spotlight them and say thank you. Uh, first one was this, the discussion around Secure Boot and uh, Microsoft's changing of the OEM policies. Some of the most rational discussion, I mean, there were still people that were very upset, but some of the most measured discussion, I thought, happened in our subreddit. I was really happy about that. Um, and then another one started two days ago by Manal in a bag. That's what it is. Wants to de Googleify his Android, and he wanted to talk about it a little bit. He says, hey, all, hasn't Chris last talked about what he did get away from Google services on his phone by using OwnCloud? Uh, anyone have information on what services were replaced? I didn't have any luck finding the references in the subreddit. And then it, what's great is the whole thread kind of turns into what other people's uh, techniques are to de Googleify uh, their Android device. Now, I am, uh, yeah, and uh, P4P3R actually nailed it. I was... Uh, I was rotating back in between an iPhone 5 and my Nexus 5. On my Nexus 5, I had Sailfish OS, Ubuntu Touch, Firefox OS, uh, Lollipop Beta, when Lollipop was in beta, and Android 4.4. So now, since then, I'm now primarily using the Nexus 5 with uh, Lollipop 5.1. And uh, what I wanted to do was I wanted to see how far I could move away from Google. And so I went with an iOS device for a little while. I hooked it up to own cloud instead of any Google backend infrastructure. And I did that for a long time. I did the same experiment on Android, did not get as far. What I found on the stock Android, I, this is rough numbers off the top of my head, but I think it was out of the 26 apps or something like this that shipped with my Android device stock, 23 of them required a Google account to use them. So I very quickly ran into walls on Lollipop. 
Um, but I found it to be more doable on iOS. What I came to the conclusion was is that because it is doable and without much penalty, I'm actually more comfortable using Android again uh, because I know I can switch to something else. I did it, and I didn't really feel much pain. I feel like I, I now have the freedom and flexibility to move around. And some of the things that have helped me do mm-hmm. that are own cloud and Telegram. And the fact that those two things are kind of independent of whatever the operating system is has made it much easier for me to switch between the different. So now I'm not so worried about Android lock and all that. If Google really starts creeping me out, I don't think it's going to be a big deal. But how do you feel about it? Yeah. I, I agree implicitly. One, the thing about Telegram, Telegram is a perfect example of an open source app that the more I use it, the more I fall in love with it. And I've gotten to a point now where I don't think if, you know, like with Viber, we all use Viber and then you decided to not use Viber. So we all jumped off. And frankly, I was so happy to get rid of Viber. If Jupiter Broadcasting ever went away from Telegram, I would still use it. I mean, I'll install whatever you tell me to use. But for, for my personal stuff, I'm, I'd stick with Telegram. The amount of things that I can do with Telegram are amazing. And I see the same thing happening, not quite there yet, but with own cloud is I, I see all the potential for own cloud and I'm, I'm getting to the point where you're at where all of these things you can and if you look Samsung actually did a very similar thing they took components core components of yeah. Android and swapped them yeah I, I know I know but they that's what they did they swapped them out one by one and replaced them with their own so what if we do the same thing we we replace messaging with telegram we replace uh, you know uh, you know file syncing with with own cloud and and once you get a couple of those things swapped out eventually it's Android becomes this shell that as long as you can install those applications and if you don't want to use the Play Store you can sideload the APKs um, then you have a usable phone and you're not relying on Google yep and that's great. Yeah, and so there's a good thread. If you're mm-hmm. kind of curious about de-Googlifying your Android device, I'll have that linked in the show notes. Thank you again to the good discussion there, stories submitted, and uh, voting. All of that helps make this show and Linux Unplugged directly better. Uh, and really, it feeds all of it, and it's a good community spot, too. LinuxActionShow.reddit.com. Thank you, everybody who works over there. Hey, if you'd like to contact Noah, well, you could email Noah at JupiterBroadcasting.com or email the show, LinuxActionShow at JupiterBroadcasting.com. Or maybe just get right in front of his face with something quick. Go over to twitter.com slash kernel Linux. And uh, we'll have a link to that in the show notes. You can follow me on Twitter. I'm twitter.com slash Chris LAS. I tweet about live shows, schedule changes. Um, I retweet people like Tyler who are wearing our swag at Linux Fest, Amazon drones, all those kinds of things on my Twitter feed. Twitter.com slash Chris LAS. And last but not least, Please join us live, jblive.tv. We do this show live on a Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific. You can go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar and get that converted to your local time zone. And also jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact. It's another way you can get a hold of us. In fact, it's a little easier because we just handle all of it for you and just have to fill out a form. Noah, is there anything else we need to cover before we get the heck out of here this week? I just want to uh, say thank you to everyone that responded to your numerous requests to send in Runs Linux. Um, I, I, we've gotten a ton of them, and we really appreciate it. And they are they get filed into a place, so when we need to pull them out, we can pull them out one by one. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, just so you know, they're not falling on deaf ears. We really appreciate it, and some of them are super cool. I don't. I think I showed you a couple of them, but uh, they're pretty neat, yep. especially the people that take the time to to film a video. Yeah. You know, of their computers I, running. Can Linux. I just give Those a pro are the tip? Coolest ones. Pro tip: if you if you put a video on there, it kind of goes towards the top of the yeah. Stack. Because I, cause right, what, I right. what do I always ask you when you tell me about it? What's the first question yeah, I always yeah, say? Yeah, yeah. What do I always first say? question, first question. I have a runs Linux. Does it have a video? I'm like, well, yeah. Um, but That's it, always but the first the, question. The, 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 it's even... It's even cooler when it's video that you took of of your own box. Like yeah. that's that's coolest of all. Yeah, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, then you know you, you get in the environment. But for me, it's so neat to see how the audience is using Linux too. You know, we're right. Really yep. About exactly. That. All right. Well, that'll bring us to the end of this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. You can find the links to everything we talked about in the show notes, also RSS feed, so you can subscribe weekly, and uh, then you don't even have to worry about it. Just get the show automatically. Pretty handy, isn't it? Okay, everybody, thanks so much for tuning this week's episode of the Linux Action Show. See you right back here next week. I, I know how I could, if I was do if I wanted to do that, if I wanted to put a custom uh, desktop environment or window manager in there, I would, I, I, could, I can set that up. But the problem is, I, how, how do I, how does, how does the layman do that? How does the person that wants to buy a box, plug it in and let it work, how do they use that? And until we get to that point, it doesn't become a usable standard. And until it becomes a usable standard, you don't have a majority of people. Do, like, for instance, Netflix is not. I, I'm sure if you went to Netflix and asked them why they don't have a Netflix app for XBMC, they would go, for what? 
And then you'd say for Cody and they would say for who? It, it, it's one of those things where if everyone used it, then then everyone would have. So, but the way to get that, the way to get everyone to use it is for it to be, you know, easy and polished and stuff like that. And there are simple things like the Wi-Fi that I just feel like should just, you know, should just uh, work. Now, the other thing I've noticed is, is there, there seems to be a common trend here, which is that any device that runs Android is basically a ready-to-go XBMC box, or I'm sorry, uh, is a ready-to-go Cody box. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, uh, yeah, literally any device. A lot of them you can just plug in a thumbstick, a uh, thumb drive with the AP, the, the Kodi APK. Uh -huh. um, some of them don't have any kind of way to do that. Uh, for example, the, the Amazon Fire TV stick. Right. Um, and in those situations, all you have to do is download an app um, uh, called ADB Fire, or there are a couple different versions of it. Um, and then you enable developer tools on the stick, which is just in the settings, um, and then you you essentially just install the app, click OK, this is where my stick is, and it'll install it right away. That is that is truly remarkable. Yeah. And, and and so and um, I, I can tell you with almost definitive certainty that that this in that information right there is going to enable us because of course being a great XBMC or, or a, a great Kodi uh, user, we I, have I do the same thing. Yeah, we go back and forth there. Uh, <laughs> is we have a Jupiter Broadcasting app. Uh, or add-on rather, a yeah. channel add-on, whatever you call them, in, uh, but we have that for XBMC, and so that actually will enable, because the Fire TV, they, we do not have an XBMC, or we do not have a Jupiter Broadcasting um, oh. app. So yeah. this that right there is going to enable us to put the Jupiter Broadcasting content inside of Jupiter Broadcasting Studios, which right now yeah. isn't exactly possible. So that I am truly, that is outstanding to hear. But I also noticed too, just because everyone likes talking in toys, would you mind if I grab the shield? Sure, no, go ahead. So, I noticed that um, essentially. I noticed that um, everyone likes to see toys, and what what they have here is the Nvidia Shield with the flip-up display running Android, and I, this is actually essentially a little portable entertainment center. Yeah, absolutely, um, and it's. Uh, so if you're familiar at home with the Shield or not, it's really it's one of my favorite devices out there. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's a gaming it's a gaming Android device, so it'll launch all of those Android games that especially have controller support. Mm -hmm. I'm a big Final Fantasy guy, and that's yeah. great for me. Yeah. Um, but of course, it'll also launch Kodi, no problem. Mm -hmm. um, the coolest thing, in my opinion, that's not that's a lie. There are too many cool things. <laughs> one of the cool things, though, is. If, if you have a, a home set up with Kodi right now, um, and it's it's running on like your HTPC, your gaming PC um, uh, that has an NVIDIA graphics card on it, you can actually use something called GameStream uh, to stream whatever's on that TV onto the NVIDIA Shield. Uh, that is awesome. Well, yeah, which includes which includes Kodi. So. You can literally take this anywhere, in your home, or you know, if you're if you're traveling anywhere, uh, log into your home PC, watch Cody from your home PC. It'll be marked as watched at home, and it'll be showing on on your little uh, Nvidia Shield, uh -huh. and and it's all seamless. It's amazing what people are doing these days. You know, and speaking of seamless, the one thing that I've always really appreciated about Cody is that. It is the it is identical no matter what I'm using it on. If I'm on Android, if I'm on a if I'm on a, if I if I if I write it to an ISO and stick it on a box, everything I, I find the same interface everywhere, and that is something that you don't see that kind of consistency from a lot of other projects. I think it really sets you guys apart.